Welcome to mmlearn.org, a program of Morningside Ministries. Our program today is how to talk to your doctor, and I'll be telling you just a little bit more about that in just a second. I want to first take a moment and extend our appreciation to the Baptist Healthcare Foundation, Methodist Healthcare Ministries Foundation, the Southwest Texas Geriatric Education Center, the Prior Trust, and all those other individuals and organizations who so generously support our mission and all that we do at mmlearn.org and Morningside Ministries. Anytime during the program that you want to ask a question or make a comment, if you notice up in the top bar you see a little bubble up there, you can look at that, click on it, and ask a question. And you can do that by typing that in via an email. You can also phone in a question to 210-889-1285. We're delighted to take those questions and we hope you'll send in plenty of them. We also need to know what you think, and up in the top of your uh, banner is a survey button, and we'd like you to click on that and give us your feedback. You know, this is the way that we're able to continue to bring these programs to you. So it'll take less than five minutes, and we ask you to do that for us today. Can't tell you how happy I am to introduce to you our speaker today on how to talk to your doctor, but a doctor. Dr. David Smith is with us today, and he is uh, the president of Geriatric Consultants, and he's going to tell you a little bit about his background before he starts. It's always better for them to do that. But I want to tell you that Dr. Smith has just completed a series for us on dementia, mental illness, and long-term care assisted living, and it even applies to independent living, that will soon be available to you. And I have to tell you that our initial response to this has been just incredible. It's everything we've wanted to know. But today, what we want to know is how to talk to your doctor. And so, Dr. Smith, I can't tell you how happy we are to have you, and I want you to know this is a relaxed doctor, so you can actually ask all the questions that you have. Thanks so much. And you've got your speaker. Oh, okay. Thank you, Maria. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Now, I'm not just sure who's all out there. Uh, this um, is a talk that would be most appropriate, not for staff, but for uh, patients. And um, so this is being recorded, and it's going to be uh, on the mmlearn.com uh, site. Uh, then you can access it perhaps for uh, as some kind of an event back at your, uh, your shop uh, to uh, present it to patients maybe at, at a later time. Um, how to talk to your doctor. Uh, and I've uh, been asked to tell you who I am. Uh, I am a practicing geriatrician in Brownwood, Texas. Uh, for many years, I was a general family doctor, set bones, delivered babies, uh, did surgery, all those things. And uh, perhaps about 20 years ago, while I was uh, teaching as a professor for the University of South Dakota School of Medicine, I uh, was uh, involved in um, a uh, geri geropsychiatry unit at the State Mental Hospital, and the school asked me to start teaching the geriatrics there. So I took a fellowship, and uh, then ever after, my career has gradually shifted from uh, being a general family physician uh, to being a geriatrician. About 10 years, 12 years ago, I made the complete jump and uh, pretty much only see older people now. Uh, it's, it's been a, a great joy for me to do so, and um, I hope that I've developed a style that uh, I can pass along to you about choosing a physician. Uh, it's important to choose a doctor when you're healthy. And too many times, uh, if, if a person doesn't have a medical home, uh, they become ill, they'll go to an emergency room or have to hurry up and get in a phone book and hunt for someone, and you, it's kind of catch as catch can. It's a better deal to uh, make that choice when you're healthy, when you can do a little shopping. Uh, there are many ways to go about that. You can uh, uh, talk to family and friends, uh, other people in the community, and ask for references. Uh, you can contact the State Medical Society uh, once you've got some names and see whether that individual that you might be choosing is in good standing. And you can certainly look for credentials. Uh, besides being an MD or a DO, uh, a physician has potentially taken boards. And uh, if you take boards, uh, the letters after your name tell uh, the, the uh, public 
uh, what things you have specially trained in. If you are uh, an older person and or have a family for that matter, it's probably a good idea, and I'm going to say that this is biased on my uh, standpoint because I am a family physician, uh, that I think it's a good idea to get a generalist. If you have a heart condition and you choose a cardiologist to be your primary doctor, uh, I guess that's all right. Uh, but the cardiologist is probably not going to uh, have spent a great deal of time uh, studying up on ingrown toenails and on flu shots and on this and that and the other thing. So it's probably a better idea to get a generalist. And then if you do have a special problem that's ongoing for that generalist to share your care with a, a specialist. The generalists that are appropriate uh, for an older person or an, uh, an individual with a family uh, would be a family practitioner or potentially a general internist. There's a new term being tossed out now. It's called medical home. <clears throat> and um, with this concept, an individual does in fact have a medical home that takes care of prevention, takes care of basic medical needs, and then reaches out to specialty uh, practices when there is a need, but doesn't just turn the patient over to the specialist. Instead, uh, they keep contact and kind of become the orchestrator uh, for the medical system and make sure that everything goes well. You should ask around when you uh, are seeking to choose a doctor, but remember that what one of your friends uh, is looking for in a physician may not be what meets your expectation. If you have a family, uh, it may be particularly important to choose a family physician. Uh, the specialty of family medicine is to be expert in those uh, issues of both health and disease that are important to families and to deal with them in the context of biological, that's the medical science, psychological, the, the emotional side, uh, the economic uh, factors, and also the social factors. So biopsychosocial. And uh, uh, many other um, specialties pick up a little bit on, on this kind of style or concept, uh, but none with the depth and uh, training that you would find with a family physician. Choose a doctor that refers when they need to. They don't try to do everything, uh, but not one that refers for everything. In, in medicine, in the doctor's lounge, we call those docs uh, the Walmart greeters. Uh, they see everybody and uh, uh, do a lot of brief office calls at the lowest level of service and then refer everybody out. Uh, that's not particularly uh, helpful for you, and it's not very efficient. Um, then there are the treaters, and those are the, the docs that will tackle what they know how to do, and they know how much they know and are willing to refer when, when they need some help. Generalists are more likely to see you as a whole person as opposed to looking at your situation just from the standpoint of your disease. Uh, medicine is, of course, an art uh, as much as it is a science, and there is a lot more to textbook knowledge that goes into this uh, uh, than um, uh, one might think. I actually knew a doc way back in my first practice uh, 35 years ago who really kind of wasn't very good. Uh, he kind of didn't know what he was doing. His medicine was extremely old-timey. Old and the guy was such a nice guy and had such a good manner about him that he could do the wrong thing and it would come out all right. I, I, I really feel like uh, uh, there was a huge placebo effect to what he did and that, that people uh, wanted to get better just so they didn't disappoint him. Um, probably is still going on, although we'd like to think that our doctor also knows the medical science. When you're choosing a physician, look for one that has an emphasis on preventative medical care. And that's not just primary preventative medicine, like giving everybody a flu shot in the fall. 
uh, but secondary preventive medicine, which is to understand the likely risks if you have certain risk factors, uh, such as um, uh, checking for tuberculosis in any patient that's going into a nursing home, or tertiary preventative medicine, which is to know what are the risks of a disease or for complications of a disease and keeping an, an eye on checking those preventatively, such as checking um, for kidney function in those people who have diabetes. So that's primary, secondary, and tertiary. Prevention is always better uh, than um, waiting till something has happened and then trying to put a lid on it. A lot of this talk is going to be about becoming an involved patient. Uh, that means taking a lot more responsibility for your health, and if you're ill, taking responsibility for your own treatment and your recovery. Now, that's kind of not the way medicine has gone in the distant past, where doctors were very paternalistic and prescriptive, and uh, they gave you a prescription, and you're just supposed to follow it. That's probably not how most of us would like to see medicine go now, neither the doctors or the patients, let's hope. Doctors have uh, individual styles, uh, various personalities. Some are handsome and bubbly and, uh, and social, uh, others perhaps not. Uh, some are thorough, some are cursory, some are old-timey and some are up-to-date. Some are interested and some appear to be distracted. Some of them listen to you and some of them interrupt. And you may want to pay attention to that doctor style during the first visit to decide is this guy or gal going to be the one that I uh, stick with as a medical home. It's interesting that the old-fashioned medicine of paternalism where the doctor dictates uh, to the patient actually generates more lawsuits. There's just a lot more uh, chances for the patient to be dissatisfied if they're not a partner in their care. And I could have put another bullet in here and said that in the paternalistic practice, there's a lot more patient non-adherence or non-compliance. The doc will prescribe something that they want to mandate, here's how it's going to be, but they didn't collaborate with the patient, and so the patient doesn't follow what uh, has been uh, prescribed. The patient needs to be more assertive if you want to get your doctor to be a partner in your care. That's partly because you're, you're, by your behavior, you're telling them what your expectations are. You want to be inquisitive. It is your life, and no matter how skilled or how compassionate your doctor is, your life is still a lot more important to you than it is to him or her. Why are there problems? Well, uh, in the past there was a great mystique, uh, uh, but uh, it's still present, uh, and the docs may uh, hold a position of kind of awe with the patients or with uh, even of, of fear. And um, that does not bode well for a good, free interchange of ideas and communication. Uh, additionally, there could be denial on your part. Uh, you may wish to hide symptoms because you really don't want to know the right answer uh, because it's scary. Not a good thing. Don't withhold information. Uh, I've had patients that seem to be wanting to test my skill uh, because they don't tell me some important facet of their, of their condition. Or uh, others certainly may withhold information out of embarrassment or because they're denying their illness, because it's too scary to think about, oh gosh, I might have cancer or heart disease, um, don't do it just because you think it's not important. Uh, you need to give the doc all the tools necessary to make a proper uh, diagnosis. You know you're getting old when everything hurts and what doesn't hurt doesn't work. This slide is about communication. You remember in uh, the movie Cool Hand Luke, the uh, warden of the prison standing up on the hill, the guy, the inmates are all down there breaking rocks, and he says, what we got here is a failure to communicate. Well, communication gap is the most serious stumbling block uh, to an effective doctor-patient relationship. Seventy-five percent of what uh, leads a doctor to make a correct diagnosis actually comes from your history. Only 15% of diagnosis rests with the physical examination 
and even less, 10 percent, uh, rests with laboratory tests, x-rays, and so forth. Now, this is a very important point here and one to look at how a doctor's style in practice is. Because if your doc, you walk in and you give your complaint and he says, well, tell me a little bit about it, and you get 30 seconds into your description and he starts interrupting you and writing down laboratory tests that he wants. That doc is casting his bread upon the waters, so to speak. Uh, as opposed to the, the, the good style of medicine who listens intently, gets all of the history information with which to make a presumptive diagnosis, a hypothesis, and then uses physical examination and laboratory and x-ray testing to confirm or deny that hypothesis. When you cast your bread upon the waters, when you just take, you know, order an MRI or order blood tests, uh, because the patient has a headache or some other symptom. The chances that that test will be negative, and actually that's a, that's a false negative, and the individual could in fact have that problem, go up, and the doc would miss it. More importantly, if you cast your bread upon the waters, and you order a test without being pretty sure that that's what you're looking for, the chances that you will have a positive test, something is wrong on the test, and it's actually meaningless, it's a false positive, become very, very high. So you do an MR, you, you got a headache, and the doc takes a cursory history, just decides, okay, I'm going to get an MRI on this one, and you get an MRI and there's this fuzzy little spot on there, and then he says, oh, okay, now we better do an EEG, and we better do a pneumoencephalogram, and we better do this, and we better... And those are negative, so then they do another battery of tests, and then one of those is positive. Pretty soon, heck, you could end up with a craniotomy and have nothing wrong with your brain. You maybe had a tension headache in the first place. Don't laugh. That kind of stuff does happen. And it's partly because remuneration for the doctor visit has changed. And... Uh, Laboratory and x-ray tests and procedures like endoscopies, putting the scope down the, the, the into the stomach to look around, are rewarded lots better than talking with the patient and doing a physical examination. They're, they're, the procedural stuff is rewarded a lot better. That can drive a, a doc in the direction of, of doing those tests. Also, litigation has pushed doctors in the direction of doing more tests to prove on paper uh, what they think they're, that they're going to do and uh, keep themselves out of lawsuits. That is not a good reason to be doing uh, uh, tests in medication and medicine. About 50 or 60 percent of all the illness that I have seen in, in my practice as a family doctor uh, has either an emotional basis or has an emotional component to it. And so you can imagine that if there's a communication gap between you and your doctor and, and the doc isn't picking up on the emotional factors, also maybe the social and the economic factors, that makes uh, the, the job of diagnosis even harder. Before seeing your doctor, rehearse what you plan to say. It's easy to get in there. The place smells funny. It smells like alcohol and other stuff. And um, everybody's running around in white coats, and it's kind of scary and uh, very unfamiliar. And it can make you nervous, and you can forget stuff. Uh, you can put the wrong emphasis on various things. A variety of things can happen with the communication. So rehearse what you're going to do at home. In fact, grab a piece of paper and a pencil and make a list and write down what you intend to say and what you intend to emphasize. Everything that you're going to present to the doctor should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. Remember that what a doctor, you know, doctors say are businessmen. We've got to make a living, too. We've got to, keep, we've got to pay our staff. We've got to keep the lights on and pay the telephone bill. And what we have to sell is time. Every, you know, when, when you go to Walmart and you buy something, Sam Walton is making a, a couple of pennies off of the work of all the stock boys and the checkout counter people and all that. And, uh, but the doc 
doesn't make any money on the nurses or the x-ray tech or anybody else. The only money that's made is with your time. And so time becomes very precious, and it's very important for that interaction between patient and doctor to be highly efficient. Now, the doc needs to give you enough time to say your story, but you can't waste that time either. Know your past history. Be ready with it. Uh, in fact, it's maybe a good idea to have a comprehensive medical history in your uh, notebook that you can take with you to the docs. Uh, you should know what medical illnesses you have had in the past, about when they were diagnosed, and you should know whether the diagnosis was firmly established or whether it was kind of questionable. You want to know if it's progressive or is it stable. If there have been past surgeries, when were they done, where were they done, and if any surgery was ever recommended but not performed, a doc really needs to know about that, of course. We need to know about what past hospitalizations you've had. If you're taking medications, we need to know about those. We need to know the names of the drugs, what the doses are, how long you've been taking them, why you're taking them. Some drugs are used for more than one disease. So are you taking the Depakote because you've got seizures, or are you taking the Depakote because you've had bipolar illness? Why are you taking them? Recent blood tests to test the drug levels if you've had them. If you're on Coumadin, when was the last blood test and what was the result? Don't forget to talk about over-the-counter medications when you, and herbal medications when you uh, are, are listing your, your drugs. Uh, just because they're over-the-counter doesn't mean they're benign, that they don't have side effects. It doesn't mean that they don't have interactions with other drugs, either over-the-counter or prescription drugs. They are extremely important in that regard. You should know your history of allergies to medications. Now, many times patients will feel that they have an allergy when it's really a side effect. So not only tell me I'm allergic to Benadryl, not likely, but also tell me that the allergy reaction that you had was it made you sleepy. Then I know that's a side effect. We need to know your smoking history, past and present. We need to know whether you use alcohol. My slide says don't hide it from your doctor. That means don't hide your alcohol history from your doctor. If I make a house call, you're not supposed to hide the alcohol. I want to know where your sherry bottle is. You uh, should tell us if you use any other drugs, particularly street drugs. We're not the people that are going to turn you into the cops, but we need to know. Immunizations that you've had, workplace uh, issues, stress, pollutants, chemicals, and know your diet. Know the medical history of your family, any diseases that have occurred in more than two of your family members, and what caused early deaths in your family, if any. You know you're getting older when the gleam in your eyes is from the sun hitting your bifocals. During the visit, if necessary, bring someone along with you that's more assertive than you are if you're a little bit of a shrinking violet. It's better for the communication, um, but be sure that you do most of the talking yourself. Tell the doctor your problem, not your solution. Nothing makes me more upset than to have somebody come in and say, Doc, I need a shot of penicillin, or Doc, I need an antibiotic. That's what I'm there to decide. The reason they made these various treatments into prescription drugs or other things is because it requires a medical license to decide whether it's a good idea or not. Uh, so, uh, so don't go in and dictate uh, the, the uh, prescription or the solution to the problem. Even worse than having the doc be upset and angry about you telling him or her what to do is the doc that's so busy or so interested in making the office call fee that he'll agree with you and just do it. And it's the wrong thing. What not to do. Don't wait until you're half dead to go in and, and see the doc. Illness is always easier to treat and less damaging if it's caught sooner. Don't be theatrical. Don't embellish your symptoms or, or, or get all uh, uh, theatrical about it. Uh, um, you know, I, well, I'm thinking for an example and I'm not coming up with one. But don't, also, don't be repetitive or give unneeded details. Come in to see the doctor with your backache. 
uh, you, uh, the doc says, well, when did it start and, and what, what maybe aggravated it in the first place? Oh, well, I went to Walmart. I went down aisle 13, and they have, were having a special on soft drinks, and uh, the, the full cases were really a good price. They were, you know, such and such a price. Now, I drink diet, but my husband drinks uh, uh, the regular stuff. He doesn't like the diet, so I had to go way down on the lowest counter to get the cases. Of, just, give me the, just give me the facts. Remember Joe Friday? Just the facts, ma'am. I lifted something heavy, made my back hurt. Be able to relate your current problems well. When did the problem begin? Uh, have you had this problem before? If so, is it worse than it was before? Has it changed over time? How did it start? Exactly where is it? Uh, does it spread or radiate to any part of the body? Exactly how does it feel to you? Is it a sharp pain, a dull pain, an electric shock? Uh, what exactly does it feel like? Has it changed over time? Is it constant or variable? Uh, how bad is it? Sometimes we use a 0 to 10 scale on that. Have you found anything that makes it worse? That's called an aggravating uh, uh, circumstance. Or is there anything that relieves the symptom? That's an ameliorating factor. In relaying the problems, did you notice anything else before or at the time of onset? Some things that happen first might be triggers. Uh, I see flashing lights, and the next thing I know, I'm unconscious. Aha, a seizure. Uh, Sometimes it's the, the thing that you see before is something that predicts the symptom coming on. I see spots before my eyes, before my headaches. To, aha, it's a migraine. Has anyone in your family, uh, a friend or a coworker, had the same thing? Uh, does it come and go? When? Is there a family history of similar problems? In geriatrics, particularly, we have a problem with uh, certain common medical uh, issues being what we call ego dystonic. It's embarrassing uh, to talk about them, and it, to, to say that you've fallen down or have memory loss, had sexual problems, been incontinent, uh, or had family troubles of one thing or another, not only is embarrassing, but it, it sort of drags down your self-esteem. But try and remember that doctors do this all day long, we hear this kind of stuff, and it isn't very uh, upsetting to us. It doesn't make us look down our nose at anybody when they come in and uh, make a complaint about this. During the visit, be assertive, but don't try to put the doctor on the defensive unless that becomes absolutely necessary in the end. Uh, describe any treatments tried so far. Uh, and what the results were. Did it help? Did it not help? Did it make it worse? Just a word or two about medical jargon. Uh, don't tolerate it. You don't have to get angry, but don't tolerate it if your doctor talks to you in medical language that you don't understand. Ask your doctor to explain what he just said in, in uh, plain English. You can even laugh about it. Don't just sit there in silence because what the doc is telling you is probably important. And uh, if you sit there and are confused, but you nod your head, uh, that's kind of the socially acceptable thing to do. But in the medical office, that's not what you want to do. You want to say, whoa, 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 I am not getting this. You're using uh, $20 words, and I want you to use common language. Uh, there is no medical problem that the doctor cannot explain in good common English. As far back as 1973, this important problem was recognized, and a 1973 commission on medical malpractice can be quoted as saying it's a physician's duty to translate terms into language the patient can understand so that complete communication can be achieved. You know you're getting older when you regret all those mistakes, you resisted temptation. About medications, that is, the medications the doctor is, is likely to prescribe, you will want to ask the doctor, what exactly is this medication for? Why am I taking this now? What are the directions for its use? How and when will I know if it's working? Uh, how long will I use it? What would happen if I didn't take this? 
Uh, is there some monitoring I need to do? Do we need to do blood tests every so often? Do I need to be checking the blood pressure or doing something else to determine uh, how this medicine is working or whether it might be causing a side effect? You want to ask, go ahead and ask, what are the alternatives to this medicine? Are there generics? Are there other drugs that maybe are not quite as good but don't have uh, the same load of side effects or the cost? Uh, what exactly are the side effects? Are they common or are they rare? Are they serious or are they a nuisance? You want to ask straight up every time, are any, is this medicine going to interact with many, any of my other medications? It is so easy for even a good doctor to let this slip their mind. And as long as you ask the question, is this going to agree with the other stuff that I take? It will trigger us to go back and look at the medication list and make sure that there isn't going to be something that interacts with the medication. Now, sometimes the interaction is that you're already on something that can make you sleepy, and I've just given you something else that can make you sleepy. They could add together and make you really sleepy. Or it could be that one drug cancels out the other drug. It could be that one drug causes the other drug to become toxic. And, and get too high. Uh, uh, all of those things are possible and actually fairly common. There's on the last bullet on this slide is medical jargon. I just told you not to talk in, uh, that, I, that I'm not supposed to talk in medical jargon, but I want to teach you this one. NNT stands for number needed to treat. And NNH stands for number needed to harm. Now if you're really a top-notch patient and you want to let your doctor know that you're savvy, when you get all done with the, and they, you've got that prescription in your hand uh, for, let's say, uh, a drug to lower your cholesterol, you can ask that doc, how many patients need to take this medication for one patient to be helped? So if I take this medicine that you just gave me that's going to cost me $43 a month. Uh, how many patients need to take this for one person to avoid a heart attack or a stroke? For most statins, that number is about 1 in 20. That means that 20 people take it and 19 people didn't get any benefit for their 43 bucks a month. One person avoided a stroke or a heart attack. You need to kind of know that statistic in order to decide, is this worth it? Uh, too many times the doctor's choices are driven by the fact that we feel obliged to do anything that can be done to prevent various medical outcomes. And unless the economics is brought into it and unless the weighing of risks and benefits is brought into it by you, this may not be on the doctor's front burner of their thinking. Number needed to harm is the question, how many people need to take this medicine for one person to be harmed by it? And uh, that, too, is a very clear statistic that helps you decide how dangerous is this medicine? Is it worth me taking? After the examination, uh, and the doctor has explained to something to you, it's a good idea to repeat it back to him or her uh, in your own words. Do it right away, right at the end of the examination. Uh, studies have been done repeatedly, and almost all of them show just about the same result, and that is that patients, regardless of educational level, forget about one-fourth of what the doctor said to them in the office by the time they have walked out of the door. Imagine how much more of it is forgotten by the time you get home or the, by the time a month has gone by. So it's very important to do that repetition. It helps to have the doctor double check, did, he, did you hear him right? And number two, did you get it all? Write down what the doctor is telling you in the office, especially if it's very, very important, or ask the doctor to write it out. And many doctors do use pre-printed handouts for the common diseases and medications and so forth, so just ask for them. Don't be afraid to tell your doctor if you don't understand. Actually, most doctors respect that 
and will be pleased if you can circle back and get it right. Ask the doc if there's any patient education pamphlets that you can have. They may have them, or there may be a website that you could go that they'll recommend to go to for uh, additional information. And if you have questions after you get home, call back in, talk to the nurse. If there's been a treatment such as surgery or a medication that sounds like it's really expensive or like it has some pretty significant side effects, and you're just not sure, you have that little birdie talking to you, don't be afraid to ask some questions. Ask if there are other options. If I do nothing, what will happen? What are the side effects of this drug or operation? Are there other options? Is there something else I could do? What should I expect? How soon after beginning the treatment would I notice a difference? For what problems should I call you up? Are there any special precautions? Will this medicine cross-react with my other medicines? How does this medicine work? What's its mechanism of action? Will the directions be on the bottle? They almost always are, but not a bad question to ask. If what's been told to you uh, just doesn't sit right, that little birdie is talking to you, you can ask for a second opinion. I want you to quote Dr. Smith if your doctor gets cross, and you can say, Dr. Smith said, no good doctor objects to a second opinion. It doesn't, if, he, if the opinion was a good opinion, the next doctor is going to give it too. And uh, you'll be reaffirmed by that. If medications are given, you can ask for what's called a package insert. And you can ask for that from the doctor, but it's actually easier to get it from the drugstore. It's, it's called a PI, and it's very extensive, and it's in medical language, but uh, worth getting. If you feel you cannot possibly follow the treatment plan that the doctor has outlined for you or can't possibly afford the medications or you just don't feel you can risk the complications of the medications that have been prescribed and told to you, uh, then you need to tell your doctor about that right away. Be honest with both yourself and your doctor. There is usually a simpler regime. There's something else that can be done, although it may not be as effective as what your doctor first prescribed. If the best treatment can't be followed, it's not worth very much. You maybe better go to plan B. Learn about your condition. There's lots of uh, valuable information on the uh, web, on the, uh, uh, the Internet now. Uh, knowledge about your general body and about your specific condition will actually help you get more time with your doctor. If you're talking to him or her and making sense and asking good questions, uh, that doc is going to pay attention and, and provide you with more information. It'll probably lead to more in-depth and thoughtful care. But when you get on the Internet, be especially careful to consider the source. There is also a ton of junk out there. There's a lot of charlatans. There's a lot of snake oil salesmen. There's a lot of uh, upset or disgruntled or not very mentally healthy people that have a, uh, a burr under their saddle that have written stuff to go on the internet to say how awful such and such is or such and such causes autism or this and that and the other thing with no scientific foundation. And you can really get yourself uh, crosswise if you start reading a lot of bad information. So it may be wise if you're not sure about the uh, uh, status of a website if, you, if it's not coming from the Mayo Clinic or uh, uh, someplace that you recognize as the, uh, a government source, that you recognize as being truly authoritative, ask your physician or your nurse about it and see if it is, in fact, a good source of information. Be a smart patient. Ask questions. Take notes. Read up on your body symptoms and disease. Be an accurate reporter of symptoms. Don't give up the responsibility for your own health. Speak up when you feel that the diagnosis of the treatment is wrong or if it's wrong for you and you're not going to be able to follow it. Know your rights as a patient. Now, I haven't given you the whole uh, long formal document of uh, patients' rights, but in a nutshell, you have the right to your own medical records. The doctor owns the paper, but you own the information. You have the right to be fully informed of anything the doctor finds in language that you understand. You have a right to a reasonable amount of your doctor's time. 
You have a right to be educated about your illness. You have a right to question and to be critical when that's necessary. In summary, be honest, be thorough, and prepare before you go. Stick to the point. Ask questions. Collaborate with your doctor to create a health care plan with which you can comply. You know you're getting older when you know all the answers, but nobody really chooses to ask you the questions. And I'm going to go to the Q&A now. Thank you. From Mary, finding a new doctor. How can I leave my primary care doctor and not hurt his feelings? I need someone new. Is the office required to send my records if I ask, or should the new doctor ask for them? Yes, indeed, the new doctor should ask for them. Uh, the answer to the first part of your question is hard to answer without knowing some more details. Uh, if you have a really good relationship with your doc at a personal level, but it looks like he, she is kind of missing the boat on something, you might not leave them. You might sit down and talk to them frankly about that and then ask for a second opinion or for a consultation with someone else, a specialist in that area. Uh, if you really have made up your mind to choose someone else, you might um, send a thank you card uh, to, to your old doc to let them know that you're not leaving them because you're mad or anything like that. It will also relieve that doctor's um, concerns that you might be angry and going to sue them or, you know, just why is this happening. If you were leaving because of a concern related to the office practices, the, the economics or whatever, a thank you card with a well politically stated reason would be really, really good feedback that your doctor might appreciate. If they're doing something wrong in that office, like having exorbitant weights in the waiting room, it's really good to hear that from patients and, and the docs say, oh my goodness, I'm losing good patients because I've got something going wrong in my office and then they can endeavor to fix it. I hope that helps. Uh, Donna, health care reform. Thank you. I know you are not here to talk about health care reform, but I love to. Uh, but do you think we will still have the same access to medical care or do you think that things are going downhill? I am indeed afraid, Donna, that things have already gone downhill. Uh, I'm old enough, 62, I've uh, been in practice for gosh how many years then, uh, to have been primarily a fee-for-service doc when I first got out uh, with um, private insurance being the, the third-party payer uh, most often and a handful of patients being out-of-pocket private pay. Uh, in that setting, there was an economic incentive for the doctor to deliver more, medic, more medical care than was absolutely necessary in order to make more money. If we talk about it honestly, the incentive for the doc was to do more in order to make some more money for yourself. That got to be an outlandish problem as time went on and third party payers um, uh, were, were complaining because in that paradigm not only did the doctor want to deliver more med medical care to you, see you more often, do more tests, give higher priced drugs, etc., because it made the doctor more money, but actually patients joined with the doctor because they felt like, well, more is better. So sure, I want the extra x-ray. Sure, I want the higher price. It must be better. It's higher priced. It's another layer of service, so I want that. Johnny fell down on the playground, bumped his head. He was briefly knocked out. Every patient got a, a brain scan to make sure they didn't have a blood clot in the brain. They didn't need it, but we got it. And the third-party payers finally rebelled, and we slipped over to HMO medicine. HMO medicine, the basic paradigm, it's very simple, is that the doctor and the HMO make more money by delivering less care. Hopefully the dynamic is more positive on preventative medical care, that there's an incentive for the HMO to deliver better preventative care in order to make more money because you're going to prevent expensive downstream events, right? Wrong. The public 
changes HMOs like they change socks. And so HMOs have not been as incentivized as you might expect to do good preventative medicine because all they'll do is prevent the diabetes from getting worse and the reward hap gets, gets realized by the new HMO that the, that the patient has just changed over to. So it has not worked out as good as we thought. We need to get back to a doctor-patient relationship, a, a caregiver-patient relationship, where that uh, give and take has marketplace uh, dynamics and better uh, choices are made uh, for both the economic reasons and for health reasons. And I think we are indeed going in the wrong direction. Uh, Maryland, subject vaccinations. I, just, uh, I was just told to get a pertussis vaccination. I am 60 years old. What's your opinion on this? You know, I'll have to look that one up. That is, that's wild. I wonder if there's a pertussis outbreak in your area or something that has led to that. Um, I, I apologize that I'm not able to answer that question at the present time. Maybe some of our helpers right there can Google it right now and see what the deal is. Question, what if you don't know much about your family history? How will the doctor compensate for that lack of information? Well, you need to write down that the family history is not available. And um, I would probably be a little bit more generous with my screening, um, with my screening uh, laboratory testing and so forth in order to try to compensate for that. Uh, but sadly, I think the, 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 the real answer is that you're missing an important piece of the puzzle that can't be compensated for. Uh, from Nina, will this presentation be available online after the presentation is over? Absolutely, yes. After the live presentation, the slides that I project, projected will be available on link paperclip icon. Uh, after the above title of this video. Let's see, from Lewis, sample medications. How do you feel about doctors giving out free samples of meds? Sometimes they don't have much information attached to them. Well, uh, that's a mixed bag. It's certainly uh, helpful uh, to give samples to somebody that um, is uh, down on their luck and, and can't afford the meds. It's helpful to give samples of a medication that you're just not sure whether this is going to be beneficial, whether it's going to cause a little new side effect, so you, you can try it out a bit before you have to go buy some. Uh, on the other hand, samples are oftentimes misused and given in large quantities, uh, which is unfair to the manufacturer who meant them to be a marketing uh, tool. And uh, j just can be a, an inroad for the, um, for the drug company to win favor with the doc so that they will prescribe more of their drug. And that's not a good reason to do it. Uh, I'm on a formulary advisory board for a national pharmaceutical supplier chain and um, uh, am, am uh, very interested in docs not being biased or influenced to prescribe uh, by marketing techniques. I'd like to have our docs know the costs as, as well as the attributes, both efficacy and side effects of drugs, and choose their prescriptions based on those factors as opposed to whether the detailed person that comes to see them brings them lunch or whether they're a pretty good-looking young gal or whether the doc gets a lot of samples or coffee cups or any other thing. Okay, Rebecca, my father passed away, I'm sorry, from pancreatic cancer in 86. My mother now has pancreatic cancer. Is there a predisposition for me to get pancreatic cancer? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, this is uh, something you will want to pay attention to and um, probably not uh, uh, an area that a family physician would immediately bing, bing, have an answer to uh, in terms of what extra screening might you do? Uh, many of the malignancies inside of the GI tract come in batches, so it might not be just uh, without me looking, I'd have to look it up for you if I were your doctor. 
uh, by pancreatic cancer may be batched with colon cancer or some other uh, GI cancers that we would also have to be concerned about and screen uh, more vigorous, vigorously. Um, let's see. From Rebecca, I just moved to San Antonio. I've always seen an internal medicine doctor and plan to find a new one. My 12-year-old daughter has always seen her pediatrician since birth. Would it be appropriate for my daughter to see the internal medicine doctor, or should I seek out a pediatrician? 12 is a little young for most internal medicine docs, uh, but there are quite a number, and I think San Antonio is big enough that if you search, you may find a doc that is cross-trained in pediatrics and internal medicine. When you do that, you're almost hybridizing or making a family practitioner. Um, the, uh, the, the other way to go would be to stick with a pediatrician for your daughter until she's maybe in the neighborhood of, of uh, 18 or 20 and then shift over uh, to an internist like yourself. I have a note here that there are no more questions. And um, if the uh, questioner who asked about the pertussis will um, stay in touch with the website, we will endeavor to get you an answer for that one. Thank you. Well, Dr. Smith, I can't thank you enough. I want you to know that we have these additional resources that are available to you and note, uh, as Dr. Smith said, uh, after this program is uploaded and on demand, there's a little paper clip at the top that you can click on, download all the slides that you saw today and these additional resources as well. So you can see there's a lot of them and we hope you'll take advantage of them. Uh, in addition, I want to thank all of our donors and our partners again for all that they do to make these presentations possible. Uh, all of you who have joined us today were appreciative, and those of you who will be watching this on demand, uh, we value that you join mmlearn.org at Morningside Ministries. A reminder, please fill out the surveys for us. This is what allows us to continue to be able um, to provide these programs, and I promise you it is less than five minutes, probably less than two, to be honest. Uh, if you're viewing this I Care for any continuing education, uh, that will be uh, something that you'll read more about and it will be on site for you. If you'd like to support older adults and their caregivers through education and training provided by our organization, please contact us at 734-1211. Uh, or you can write to us at info at mmlearn.org. And on our website, there is a donate button. And you can see it right down there. And please use that and make a donation with a credit card. We don't want to beg. I don't want to sound like a public announcement, but we think this is important information that we're providing to you. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Let others know about this broadcast. You can click on that email and send an invitation to someone else to watch. We look forward to seeing you again for our next series. Thank you again. Have a good day.